Hello, everyone, and uh, thanks for tuning in to Scottish Independence Podcast again. Today, Fiona and I are sitting here with two guests, Bill Ramsey and Isabel Lindsay, uh, and we're going to be talking to each other about, uh, about the film Oppenheimer. Now, Bill and Isabel are both stalwart campaigners against nuclear arms, but Bill contacted us and said, can we do this? Can we come in and, and have a chat about that about that film? So uh, we're always dead keen to talk to both Isabel and Bill, so we just jumped at the opportunity. Uh, the other thing we did was Fiona and I thought, well, we'd better go and see Oppenheimer. It is a film I, I would have gone to see anyway. I, I was a little bit aghast when I discovered it was three hours long, but actually didn't even really notice the three hours going by. So welcome to both of you. Bill, it was your idea. Go on, you start. Okay. I did a, a short blog piece for Scottish Life Review. I'm an editorial board of Scottish Life Review, as it happens. And I did a blog piece about the movie. And the question I was interested in was the impact that it might have politically on a younger generation. Oh. Because as an anti-nuclear activist, I'm particularly interested in, in, in and also as chair of a Peace Education Scotland, a, sh a small... Um, a, a charity that was set up by Scottish SND uh, to um, take forward uh, issues of nuclear weapons among young people. And I, w I remember back in 1997 when Braveheart came out, it had an impact uh, on Scottish young people. Now, I'm not suggesting that Oppenheimer would have an impact on Scottish young people per se, but young people in a more general sense, and I was interested in that. And so I decided to go along to a showing the day it opened, and I was going to go to the Glasgow Film Theatre, as one does as I live in Glasgow, and it was fully booked. So I went along to the, um, the um, Cineworld for the half past four showing. And I walked in, and I got one of the last tickets, and it was a full house, but it was a demographic that goes to the cinema at 4.30 on a Saturday afternoon. In other words, young people. So there I was, sat in the back row, and literally hundreds of young people who this would be their first exposure, if I may put it to that, to a nuclear weapons, other than as a backdrop to a, a sort of plot for some dystopian movie. So in other words, not only in Glasgow, where there were hundreds, but all over the world, young people were being exposed to, for the first time, a bit about nuclear weapons. And the extent to which that might have an impact on them. Because I remember with Braveheart as a teacher, after 97, young men started to wear kilts to um, proms. There was a greater incidence of seeing kilts at weddings and so on, apart from certain groupings where it had been before. And the popular cultural aspect of what I'll call tatum, or whatever way you want to put it, increased somewhat. So the issue is to what extent would uh, this leave an impression on young people and how it could be taken forward by the anti-nuclear movement. And I'll finish with just at the moment with this one point. ICANN, the International Campaign Against Nuclear Weapons, were on the ball because uh, before the film came out, in the run-up to the film, they'd already produced some uh, briefing materials for schools and others. And uh, when the film did come out, they, they, they continued to uh, produce materials. Uh, and from a Peace Education Scotland perspective, that's really useful for us. So that impact initially, I thought that can be utilised by a, the anti-nuclear web movement, particularly if the movie, which is broadly, I would say, broadly critical of mm -hmm. nuclear weapons, um, you know, that it, 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 it's an asset for the anti-nuclear movement. That's really interesting. I hadn't even thought about the, the, who would be, you know, the audience that, that would be drawn into that. I mean, and actually, if anything, a bit of me probably assumed it would be more, it would be older people there. So it's really interesting. You went at that time of day and there you go, full of the younger generations. Um, I think that's really intriguing. Is, Isabel, what, what about yourself? Bon? Well, first of all, a confession that I haven't yet seen the film because uh -huh. living in a rural area, you don't pop out to the cinema <laughs> in that way. But I've read extensively about it and about Oppenheimer and about the whole Manhattan Project and this. I, I mean, I think the Nolan and the ones who have, who've uh, financed and made the film 
Uh, I think I have to be greatly congratulated because this is an area in which there is so much. It's partly ignorance and it's partly because people don't want to think about it. And I think this has made whatever criticisms one might make, and I think there are some real criticisms, but whatever criticisms one might make, this I, I think has opened up to so many people areas of understanding about the development of nuclear weapons, the implications, it has forced them perhaps to think about it. So I, th I think that is the, the great value. This, this is a, a film and an issue with great moral complexities. <laughs> so it's, it's not quite in the brave heart category, if only it were. But there are great complexities there. And I think there's very, very important educational implications there. And certainly the trigger, I think, for many conversations, because I know just last week, uh, my son and his wife did manage to get to see it uh, in Edinburgh and uh, came back to me with so many questions <laughs> ah. <laughs> that uh, although they were much more aware than the majority of the population, that they operate in a quite political uh, family context, but nevertheless, there were lots of things in it they didn't know and lots of questions they wanted to ask. Mm. So it's really valuable and important for the anti-nuclear movement. What were the main questions that they that they asked? Was there any that surprised you that they, they didn't know coming from that kind of family background? Well, I think one of the questions, uh, of course, they did want to ask because they knew that their grandfather, uh, my father, had been uh, in Hiroshima uh, just after, shortly after, probably about a month or so, after the bomb had been dropped. So they, they knew that, but had never asked about it. That, you know, how did he end up there? What had happened? What did he see? Where did he live? <laughs> These kinds of questions. But also, why <coughs> was it uh, that they went ahead with bombing Japan when the war was so obviously an end and all these kinds of uh, questions they were asking and stimulated by the film itself. That was one of the main questions I came out of it with because the thing that I thought they did really, really well was they showed how you can get caught up in the excitement of designing something new and Absolutely. solving scientific challenges but not stop to think, should we be doing this? It was just all about, can we do it? And you can kind of see, you know, the, the thirst for knowledge that comes from the scientific universities and the, the players making it. There wasn't that responsibility on them, I don't yes. think, to say, should we be doing this? And there was only one of them, I think, who said he wasn't having anything to do with it, and the rest just no, carried the, on. One of the notable ones, Joseph Rotblatt, who incidentally, well, in the early 80s was on the Alternative Defence Commission that I was uh, I was on that Bradford University School of Peace Studies had helped to promote. And he was the only one who left the project. Uh, he was Polish emigre, but uh, settled in the UK and uh, working uh, academically here and he joined the Manhattan Project. Now at that time for many of them, they thought there was a chance that Germany was going to get the bomb. You understand the dilemmas in that situation, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the drive people would, would feel. But uh, Rotblatt, uh, when it was clear before the bomb had been fully developed, when it was clear that Germany was nowhere near developing the bomb and that their attempts had failed, Rockblatt said he was leaving the project and that it was no longer justified. I think he was the only one who did leave at that point. Now he went on to, he, he got Nobel Peace Prize eventually. He was one of the founders of Pugwash, of the scientists for social responsibility and so on. Uh, but there were a group, and this I think com comes out in the film, doesn't? That the, the, 
the Zillard, Zillard the Zillard session, yeah. There were 70 and, of them. And, and that was uh, those who did not think there was any justification at that stage for using it. Some of them thought, well, if it was to be used only in a very remote place, <laughs> underpopulated place in Japan. But of course, and Oppenheimer, the thing that is unforgivable about Oppenheimer was that he fully backed the use of the bombs. That is the big dividing line. But there were quite a lot of the scientists who didn't support the the use. Mm, yeah, as I was watching it, there's a few things that, that, that still remain stuck in my mind. So first bit that I found myself really, really emotionally engaged. In fact, I was, you know, I was tearing up, really. I was almost in tears, was, was just when they got the first trial of it to work and it had all happened. So we'd been through that. And, and of course, Christopher Nolan does that in such a dramatic, you know, the, the way he does that is so, so powerful. But it was just after that, and, and, and partly the kind of emotional response that I was feeling, I realized it's kind of like two sides of it. On the one side, there's just appreciating my background is as a research chemist. So on a, on a much, much, you know, smaller scale and nothing nothing that was ever going to harm anyone but you know the kind of excitement I, you, you, I understand the sort of excitement that was there about it was such mm -hmm. a tough project and it was so difficult to do and dangerous and 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 then it, it works I could just immediately have to some extent mm -hmm. because you see that excitement and you know amazement in in the mm -hmm. guys that have done it well it wasn't all guys but but it was nearly yeah. all guys um, and then and then the other side of that emotional response that I had at that moment in the film the flip side of it was just this uh, kind of that's just changed the world yes. that's what's what happened then changed the world and you know you kind of you know a bit about you know the development of nuclear weapons there and you can and I know that of course intellectually mm -hmm. there's something about the film that just got it to but in my in my experience, it's got to flip rounds like that, mm -hmm. and yeah. so so that was that was certainly quite a, a, a high point, of, or at least an intense mm -hmm. point from from my point of view. The other thing I liked was earlier in the film, I wasn't expecting them to go into anything of the you know the chemistry or the nuclear physics involved. They weren't going to do that in the film, but they did spend a bit of time earlier on just showing where Oppenheimer had studied around mm -hmm. Europe yes. and the people he'd studied with. And and that to me also just highlighted that pre-war, there was that community of scientists who all, were engaged, they were talking to each other, they were telling each other where they were, how they were getting on, and, and then the war happens and that splits it. Yes. They'd, they'd almost all heard of each other as well. It was almost a sort yeah. of rock, rock yeah, star it was, status, it, wasn't it? It, it, was well, a, it was a small community. Funnily enough, as it happened, Last night, it's on at the moment, it's an iPlayer. Uh, the film Radioactive, which is about the curates, oh, yeah. and of course, she dies in uh, 1934. And the interesting thing about that is how um, I think it's a very useful, as, as I say, it's an iPlayer, and the people got iPlayer, it's well worth watching because it talks about the development of, <laughs> say, what they think radioactivity is from the turn of the 20th century right through and interspersed with the movie. And it's far more, I would say that Radioactive is far more critical of, of, of nuclear weapons than say the Oppenheimer is, because it has her, because uh, she's, I won't, get, I won't do a spoiler, but they, they put her in certain settings. They put her in Hiroshima, she's having a dream or whatever it is, uh, in Chernobyl and stuff like that, Chernobyl. So, so in some ways that's more explicit. I think the interesting thing about Oppenheimer is the movie is very much seen through Oppenheimer. You know, it's about Oppenheimer, so it's through his lens, if you see what I mean. So the Manhattan Project, which is huge, he is part of it, key part of it, a controversial figure, an interesting yep. figure. Yep. But it's also interesting at the moment that because of the film, the retrospective events that are taking place by the what we will call the the nuclear community and their focus on the Manhattan Project and the sheer scale of it. And uh, I was listening to a, a seminar 
post Oppenheimer semin seminar about um, a Truman. Did he order the use of the bomb? And mm -hmm. then a historian on describing how the whole um, Manhattan Project had a momentum of all of its own. And this historian couldn't actually find an order that Truman gave to actually drop the bomb, that it was built into the system, if you see what I mean. And it was a huge system. I mean, they, they got into the stage where the aim of the project was to be producing one bomb every 12 days. And their attitude to nuclear weapons for us is quite interesting. And it's clear that some of them don't fully understand what they're doing. Sillard petition that Isabel mentioned um, with 70 scientists and they say, well, you should drop it somewhere and tell the Japanese it's, you know, it's going to, you know, and, and let them see it and then make a decision. But it's also interesting when you look, and Brian Quayle has talked talked about this for years, about um, whether uh, did the use of these two weapons, did they cause the Japanese to surrender? And even within certain, you know, military academia community, they implicitly make it clear that it was when the Soviet Union entered World War II against the Japanese, that army just fell like a house of cards. And at that point, the Japanese surrendered. Uh, and that seemed to be the decisive decision uh, for, the, you know, for the Japanese to surrender. So this idea that the Japanese are going to fight to the death, then they drop the bomb, then the Japanese surrender, it's not nearly as straightforward as that. That's um, fascinating because that all my life, that is the story that I have been given. Yes, it, and it is a phony story. And uh, even today, you hear just routinely uh, references to, uh, you know, the atomic bomb, which brought the war to an end. I don't think there's much doubt. J Japan was on its knees. It had been so enormously... Uh, devastated by the, the conventional bombing that had gone on there, but Japan was on its knees. There was no doubt that it was yeah. that there was going to be a surrender of some kind, or certainly a total defeat. But of course, there's also the important point that I don't think it comes out in the film, but certainly in in some other material, that one of the scientists in the Manhattan Project, um, Paul, uh, claims that. General Groves, who was the overall military commander on the whole project, had said to a group of scientists in his presence that the real target was the Soviet Union. They were thinking about after the war. Yeah. It was about the balance of power in the world after the war. Yeah. And, yeah. That, and, and that, was the, that was the real target. Yeah. And the terrible, shocking thing about the two bombs is, of course, they were two different types of bomb. And that the horrible thing, and this is something that, you know, be so interesting if we had a live Oppenheimer to challenge him. They had seen the bomb working uh, in, in test circumstances. Did they really want to see how the bomb worked on people? Was that what they wanted to demonstrate? And did they want to see how the two different, the fat boys and men or whatever, the two different types of bombs worked on people? Yeah. And I'm afraid that I think that's the only conclusion one can one can take because if you're simply wanting to frighten the Japanese even more, <laughs> then they could have dropped it as a demonstration bomb. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think that really came out in the film at all. No, I didn't think that there were two bomb, two types. Yeah, but, but again, it's because it's through Oppenheimer's eyes. It's not through mm -hmm. the eyes of the Japanese. It's not through the eyes even of Groves. Matt Damon plays Groves, who is the head of, I mean, he was in the Army Corps of Engineers. His main claim to fame until he was given the project was he built the Pentagon. And the Army Corps of Engineers of the United States before the war was used to build dams, Hoover Dam, things like that. Uh, and they, been, they did huge civil engineering projects. Uh, and that's why, why, why they were given it. But the interesting thing um, is also is to get back to the Japanese. Um, the Japanese, uh, when the Soviet Union entered the war, 
their army, I think it was the Kwantung army it was, it was over a million a million men, but it was a not a particularly well-equipped army by the standards of 45. It collapsed like a house of cards uh, militarily, and the Japanese at that point realised that, uh, that some of the islands of Japan would be occupied by the Soviet Union, and that scared them more than anything else. <laughs> uh, and the geopolitics from the Japanese point of view the Japanese military culture uh, at the time was utterly horrendous. Uh, and I'm not going to defend uh, the Japanese I one iota in terms of what they were prepared to do, what they did, what they were prepared to do to their own people. But when they thought, my God, the, the Soviets are going to occupy a big chunk of Japan, that was it for the Japanese military um, in, in that regard. Uh, in, in that sense, that, that was it. So the... The collapse of J Imperial Japan was caused by obviously the the war right up until forty five. But when the when the Soviet Union threw in its lot with the Western powers, that was it. Um, mm -hmm. you know, that, that was it. And, and Isabel's point, I think, about the geopolitics looking to the future is crucial. The idea of um, you know the post war situation, we've got the weapon, they don't. I mean, it's interesting also. And you get this in the movie a little. The scientists talking about, uh, and there were papers produced, some of them wrote some geopolitical papers as well, thinking that all nuclear matter should be under the aegis of the United Nations. I mean, like everything. They thought that all research on nuclear, all nuclear research should be under the aegis of the United Nations, create an agency for the United Nations to cover nuclear weapons, nuclear weapons research, civil research, the whole lot. And some papers were written to, and of course, the United States geopolitically was not was not going to do that. Yes, that occurred to me at one point, not in the, while we were watching it, but um, after all the sort of irony of that, because I, I, I'd, I'd, I'd known that there was that kind of way of thinking about it. And I did a bit of, I thought, well, was it, was it Truman? It couldn't have been just Truman that set this up because he only took over after Roosevelt. He was Roosevelt's white vice president, wasn't he? And he stepped into the job when Roosevelt died, but that Roosevelt died in 1945. So I did a bit of Google and thought, oh yeah, it was Roosevelt that set this whole thing up. He set it up in 1941 with a, well, he set up a, a group of people who would take it forward. Groves was, was, one, was one of them. And, and, um, so I'll, I'll admit that my source here is Wikipedia, but um, what it did say was that Truman didn't know anything about it until he took over as president, which I'm not sure that that, could that really be true? I mean, it was a huge project yes. going, going oh, yeah. out uh, in Nevada. Yeah, that would be quite possible. Amer American vice presidents from time to time are literally shoved in a cupboard. <laughs> it depends what the president is. I mean, we'll remember uh, oh, Dan Quayle. I oh, mean, Dan, Dan Quayle. Quayle. Yes, Dan Quayle. Quayle. And others were shoved aside. Mm -hmm. And others were a president for, you know, a vice yeah. president for a time. Yeah. So they could often yeah. be done. But it was more or less the Manhattan Project was set up. Groves went ahead with it. And the thing grew like, I mean, it was a huge project. Yeah. I mean, it was by the, by the cost of the time. Yeah. It was about two billion, I think, and now it's some like um, yeah. it would be twenty-four billion. I mean, it was one mm -hmm. of the, it was probably what one of the single biggest projects in World War Two, all mm -hmm. under this two-star uh, Army Corps of Engineers General, and mm -hmm. uh, and also set up in Tennessee. I mean, the, the, the there's a famous phrase of um, Roosevelt going to a senator in Tennessee and saying, um, "I'm going to set up this this project worth." billions of dollars and the senator immediately responds and how can we help you mr president because simply the you know the the, the industrial scale of it i mean yeah. it was huge it, it was, was absolutely huge and mm -hmm. and again it focuses from the oppenheimer point of view but he is an interesting character and mm -hmm. he has a conflicted character but invisible is right he was he was happy for the bomb to go ahead though in the second half of the movie he he then gets caught up with over the the, the the communist scare which which in mm -hmm. itself well, yes, and, and, and I think, you know, when you said earlier, just before we started recording, that you were saying, Bill, it's in a way, it's a, it's a film, there's two stories in the film. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I did know that Oppenheimer had was left-leaning politically, but I didn't know to the extent of that. And um, I, at one point I was thinking, I'm just amazed that he got the job at all, given that background. Mm -hmm. Although, of course, it was 1941, that was pre-McCarthy, and it was also yeah. pre the Soviet Union being mm -hmm. um, such a, and it was going to step into such an obvious mm -hmm. way as being, you know, opposing. Uh, 
one of the interesting things that does come out in the film, which will not be news to some of us or those who've done a wee bit on American history, but will be news to lots of people, just how many Communist parties, members and supporters there were in the US <laughs> in the 20s, 30s, and um, just how extensive and to some extent acceptable um, it was certainly in intellectual and academic uh, circumstances. Uh, you can understand in the context of the war, the with the, the, the Nazis, I mean, they did know and they, they were trying to develop the atomic bomb. And you can understand the pressure, you can understand all these moral tensions. And in fact, one of the scientists I mentioned, it's Ted Hall, I think, was one who, it, it, it has been re revealed, he did actually provide to the Soviet Union uh, valuable information. He was, in it, as uh, he was boarded, uh, information on the bomb to help them to develop the bomb, but they never took him up. And the explanation that some have uh, given for that is that uh, they knew after the war, they, they knew that he had pass the information on, but after that, he didn't do anything. So he just kept quiet and he denied absolutely everything. But the, the, the offense that Oppenheimer, who hadn't actually given the information to the Soviets, committed was that he started trying to influence public policy uh, in the US after the war. He, he uh, opposed the further development of the hydrogen bomb and then he started to actively promote the idea that nuclear weapons should be controlled by the UN, they should be under international control. So he was interfering actively yeah. in current politics and that was, that was the offence. That's so interesting that you've explained that because that was the big question that, that I was left with after the film was the way it came across was that the second half is all about kind of rehabilitating him after he's lost his security clearance and it's tracked back to having years before insulted some or embarrassed some other scientist at a meeting. It, it wasn't the scientist, it was the politician, Strauss. Okay, the, yeah, the politician, yeah. right. Sorry, yeah. yes, yeah, you're yeah. right. Yeah. So, and I came out of that thinking, really, they did all that? They spent years um, rigging committees and, you know, blackening his his name about an insult from years before. It seems such a, a tiny little yeah. thing in the overall scheme of things, but I didn't get at all from the movie what you've just explained there, mm -hmm. which was that it was because of his, the, the role he was taking in public policy de development. Did you, Marlene? Did you not, not the extent to which um, Isabel's just explained it. Um, I did, you know, I did pick up um, that he was talking kind of on the sidelines, he was talking to those scientists who were definitely um, so concerned about it and putting forward other ways of, you know, dealing with nuclear arms. So I, I took that on board. And there was a point where he, on their behalf, he, he went to talk about that to, well, it was Truman in the White House. So you got this shot with him in the Oval Office trying to put this forward. Um, and he gets ushered out quite fast. And in the, in the film, through the closing door, you hear Truman saying, uh, uh, this not, may not be the exact line, but it's something like, get, get that crybaby out of here. It's contempt. What's being yeah. expressed by Truman is yeah. contempt. Now, m maybe partly it was because, from his point of view, he made the decision, or at least he was where the buck stopped when it came to the fact <laughs> of, of, what, of what those two that, that, that were dropped. So maybe it was a, a kind of a response to that. But, but I, I didn't take it like that. I took it that that was a contempt of a, a politician who was going to do everything in his power to make, <laughs> nearly said, make America great again, sorry. Um, <laughs> put, put America in, you know, in, in, uh, as a leader of the free world. And he wasn't having any nonsense from any milksop crybaby mm -hmm. scientists. Mm -hmm.
but it's true it didn't i don't think they really kind of went it because i was sitting thinking well what's the big deal so you use your security <laughs> agreement but but of course that, that it was that meant that he couldn't actually have any say in policy when they got yeah. when they took that away from him it, it was also suggested in reading on on you know the other scientists uh, oppenheimer's brother was in the communist party and i think had continued to be so but, um but the brother of uh, um, Hall, I think, was the other scientist, if I have the name correctly, whom they did pretty well know had been a spy. But his brother was working on the intercontinental ballistic missiles this <laughs> time and was a very valuable scientist on this. So they were, they were quite happy, just convenient, just to keep quiet on him, let yeah, it go. Yeah. Yeah. because it wasn't a current issue yeah. and yeah. it was useful not to antagonize this key scientist working on another uh, project but one thing I, I wanted to ask do you think it's a fair criticism because i have seen the criticism made that off in the film that the victims are totally absent mm. oh yeah very much yeah. so. I mean, it's it, it, the film is it, it's through the Oppenheimer lens. So mm -hmm. you're you're seeing the world at that time, according to Oppenheimer, it does not go into um, the impact of nuclear weapons. And uh, in fact, that film, Radioactive, which is a season I play at the moment, mm -hmm. it was far better in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, it covers Hiroshima uh, without going into the details. It has a a street in Hiroshima moments before the bombs dropped. It has a young fireman charging into the um, the, 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 the fire in Chernobyl and it has a one or two other images of of that and, and you know very very stark. There is nothing like that in the movie mm -hmm. indeed. Again one of these um, seminars I was watching it was some a nuclear a scientist discussing the movie. You know apparently Nolan doesn't like using CGI so he was using real explosives and stuff like that. And they said they thought he, he could have made the atomic explosion much more cinematically dramatic than he did. And they make that criticism. But certainly in terms of the, the, the damage, the you know, the collateral damage, I mean, it's deliberate damage, you know, the, the, the carnage that it causes. You don't, you don't get that. It's very much through the Los Alamos lens, if you see what I mean. Yeah. I think as a piece of cinema, that's fair mm -hmm. enough. That's fair, yeah. Mm -hmm. As I say, it's sort of two stories. Yeah. It's through someone who is interesting, but I think the big takeaway is that it exposes a new generation of people mm -hmm. to the issue of nuclear weapons and the impact of you know the nuclear explosions that we simply don't get because mm -hmm. since the end of the Cold War, even before it, our governments have deliberately downplayed the impact of nuclear weapon. I mean, the deconstruction of the international diplomatic uh, nuclear um, mm -hmm. arms control ar architecture is literally being dissolved in front of our eyes. Yeah. There is virtually nothing yeah. there. Mm -hmm. And we're not getting much of that at all. Even considering the, the, the relationship between Kennedy and Khrushchev, they had the Cuban Missile Crisis and then they started to develop some form of arms control agreements, right? But today, we've got Ukraine, we've got the threat of nuclear weapons by mistake as much as anything, and a, there is virtually nothing. One wonders when was the last time that Putin and a Biden actually spoke? These are the places where we are. It's, yeah. it's it's quite horrendous and mm -hmm. in that sense bringing Oppenheimer coming out at the moment mm -hmm. I think is really opposite because mm -hmm. it means that yeah. we can start to talk about that we can talk about the Cuban Missile Crisis we can talk about how things where they try to put things in place and at the moment there is nothing mm -hmm. I mean I think the establishment at the moment the best thing could happen from their point of view is that this film goes away and from mm -hmm. their point the sooner rather than better we want to make sure we can as they say i can does is, is, mm -hmm. is, is use it to to educate the the danger now is so horrific i think some of the military people or some of the uh, military academics are actually 
more conscious and aware of this than the politicians are and do express the anxieties to a greater extent, rightly so, because the extent to which technology has developed, the fact that uh, it jumps ahead so quickly, the hypersonic weapons that are currently coming on scene, and it, it means all decisions have to be made in seconds, and they have to be made dependent on technology <laughs> telling, giving you the right messages. I mean, it is so horrific, especially because you don't have that communication and because you've got a larger number of nuclear powers. And this is the thing that's so appalling about the UK political establishment is that all the voices, which even at one time, there were at least significant minority voices in the Labour Party and the Liberals too, who were seriously engaged with disarmament issues, who were criticizing UK policy, that's all gone. They've all been suppressed. They've been given no voice at all. They've been shoved right out the way. So yes, in the Commons, we do have the SNP contingent. We know that um, one or two of them uh, I hope <laughs> the, the principal problem has since been removed from his position, but have become too friendly with what we might call the military political establishment. And we've got to watch out for this uh, because if the SNP voice is not there strongly on the anti-nuclear issues, where is there a political voice? Right now, RAF Lakenheath has been upgraded so that the American F-35s will be carrying a new a nuclear weapon. So the storage facilities there are being upgraded as mm -hmm. we speak, and yet we're hearing nothing about that in the media. Yeah. So the United States is returning to the UK with aspects of American, what they would call so-called tactical nuclear weapons from UK soil. So we've not just got the issue of removal of Trident and the Clyde. Yeah. We've now got the RAF eight Lake and he's been upgraded to to have to, to have nuclear weapons being brought back mm -hmm. to to the UK. And, and and that's something that we're certainly not talking about at the moment because mm -hmm. the media at the moment are not are not covering that. Yeah. Is that yeah. because of Ukraine then? It's what what's driving that? Part, partly, I mean part partly I think it's that. I mean, the coverage of the Ukraine war. I mean, Putin's invading, invasion was illegal. Well, from a Ukrainian point of view, they would argue an unprovoked um, attack, but certainly under international law, that, that invasion uh, was, you know, was, was not correct, you know, which shouldn't have happened. The response of the Ukrainians, one can understand, but uh, we're now in a situation where it's a, um, it's a bloody stalemate. Even, I mean, literally in the last couple of weeks, some worms within the military establishment are starting to turn. In fact, they started to turn a lot earlier. The chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, General Matt Milley, back in November, December, said it's time to negotiate. And uh, he was shut up. Kissinger even said last year sometime, he had doubts about it, but then the Davos group said, you're going to change your position in that, you're not going to get invited to Davos sort of position. <laughs> so he shut up. The squad, so to speak, left the, the left caucus within the Democratic Party before Millie. Actually, they had said time to, to get into negotiations. They were shut up, and it was actually after that that Millie came out. But what I saw last week was, to me, quite remarkable. There's a podcast run by you know their military types and it, you know military analysts, and it's called War in the Rocks, and they interviewed two academics. Uh, one, Stephen Cotkin, who is a, a biographer of Stalin, he, he works for the Hoover Institution, or he's involved with them, so he's quite right-wing, but he's doing three-volume history of Stalin, and he's a, a supporter of Ukraine. But the other one, which is a really interesting one, was a man called Michael Kaufman, who in the US is seen as one of the leading US academics in relation to Russian armed forces. And bear in mind, Kaufman was born in Kiev, when you listen to that War in the Rocks podcast last week, they are implicitly saying, this is stalemate, 
it's going nowhere the body bags are piling very high and the implication is that they need to start to negotiate i mean the politicians have literally not caught up with the analysts who are saying this is stalemate Mm -hmm. yeah. And we're now starting to see stories, <clears throat> only now, uh, stories about piles of body bags. Uh, and I'm sad to say it, but now that the piles of body bags are uh, in both sides, are Caucasian, Caucasians, these body ba bags are full of Caucasians, they're starting to sit up and take notice. You know, it's not people in Africa. So um, the carnage that's going on in Ukraine at the moment is simply unsustainable in the long term. Some of the casualty rates they're talking about are not in the World War I category they're talking about. That simply doesn't add up. But mm -hmm. tens of thousands of young men on both sides have died in this war so far. Mm -hmm. And uh, this sort of casualty rate can't be sustained for you know much longer. You, you get the supporters of either pro-Russian side or the pro-Ukrainian side, where you get hyperbolic statements of it's going to be victory for one by taking over Crimea or you know the Russians are going to be in Kiev. Neither of these things are going to happen at the moment. They're not going to happen. And they'll have to talk at some point. They'll have to sit down. They'll have to make negotiations. They'll have to open up these negotiations. The way that um, Kennedy and um, Khrushchev did after the missile crisis, I mean, yeah. I think one of the things that's happening just now is that all the nuclear powers are flexing their muscles and trying to be more prominent. S someone recently, someone on the military analyst side, said it's interesting that US submarines have been emerging. Usually they don't <laughs> here and there throughout the world. And there's no military reason for that. In fact, the, the actual military reason is the opposite. You keep them very secretive in terms of where they are. But so much of it is about saying, look, we've got the big guns, but they're all doing it. And one of the reasons they're all doing it is because they don't know what to do. In many ways, they are all trapped in this ghastly nuclear arms race. And it's getting harder and harder to identify the proper routes out. You need someone somewhere to start to do something that is of major significance. But where is that going to happen? Could happen in Scotland, <laughs> a bit down the road, but you'd have to have very strong people in charge of any Scottish state to carry it out effectively and clearly. Yeah, uh, it, that's it, what yeah. we would need. And, but something that starts to say, no, this perpetual cycle of more and more armaments, more and more destructive, has got to stop. There's got to be a break in this cycle somewhere. It's not happening. And I don't think in many ways the leaders of all the nuclear powers. See, at one time, China was quite content for many years to have a minimal nuclear de deterrence, using that word, a minimal nuclear capacity. But then in recent years, whether it's because of increased, as they perceive it, increased American threats, uh, both to itself, to Korea, etc., th they have started to speed uh, ahead too with not expanding so much its number of warheads, but expanding the sophistication of its delivery systems and so on. It's happening all over and the public doesn't understand it, isn't informed about it. It's not debated in public political circles. Mm. We've got this terrible dilemma that we're in. So that we need a way out. Nuclear countries do have their own nuclear weapons, although yeah whether we really have ours. I mean, could we fire any of them without the Americas say so? But, you know, it kind of entrap them in a, mm -hmm. a worldview mm -hmm. and a set of a set of weapons mm -hmm. that yeah. you maybe can't ever yeah. use. So if you need a way out of that, I, I mean, just going back to the film, do you think there's um, well, any way in which this film actually could maybe just start something? I, I think it could certainly start a lot of people thinking starting to think, starting to be open to examining the issues. 
which they are not just now or have not been for many years. Mm. Now, there is a positive in the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons because the great majority of countries in the world are non-nuclear, want to be non-nuclear, have committed themselves to that, want to see progress on disarmament, but it is so hard to get the, the big nuclear powers engaged. What will it take to get them seriously engaged? And of course, behind them, you've got the military and industrial complexes. And my gosh, certainly in the States and in parts of Europe, the, the military companies are doing very well just now, making mm. a lot of money. <laughs> and it's such a waste of resources in the middle of a climate emergency yes. to be focused on that. It's just, a well, it pulls yeah. me, I don't know. Profits at the moment. Uh, of the arms industry at the moment are absolutely gargantuan. They're always gargantuan, but at the moment mm -hmm. they are they, they are really, really high. The economics, if you want to put it that way, uh, for those industries behind uh, the war in Ukraine is is, is, is is quite staggering. If I can give you just one example of how it's counterproductive for a start, but there's one example of this that I came across la last week. I'll be thinking about it for a bit of time. There are big issues with NATO. My, my party voted by only 15 votes, SNP, to support NATO a few years ago. Um, so the NATO question, I think, uh, is, is, is still an issue. I think the way that Europe is responding, the way that the Germans and the French are having... The, Germans, the German economy is taking a hell of a tanking over um, a, the, you know, this war. The oil is going to India. The oil is going to China, the oil is being refined and coming back to Europe. Um, so the idea that Russian oil is not coming into Europe is just nonsense. It just means it's getting refined in India or somewhere else and then, and then getting fed back in. But an example, and it's one, sm you could almost argue a small example, take Finland. Finland rejoined NATO. I mean, they, they decided to join NATO. Now, in Finland, Finnish society has been anti-NATO for many, many years. The military in Finland and in Sweden and some countries like that, they are gagging to join NATO. Why? Because your military career, instead of the, 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 the pinnacle of, of a military career within Finland or some of the small countries as a one-star general, if you join NATO, then it's at least three-star general you can go up to as a deputy commander of this or that. So the militaries in these countries have been bunt, punting in that direction for some time. But if you take Finland, and you take Finland's armed neutrality, and uh, the, the Finnish armed forces, when mobilised through the trained reservists and all the rest of it, when they were um, neutral, would be very large. It would be about a quarter of a million people in uniform. It would have something like, I can't remember the number of artillery pieces, but over 5,000 of them, very large numbers of, of weaponry trained people. Now, I assumed that when Finland join NATO, one of the things that politicians would do, oh, well, we're part of this big military alliance. It's order of battle, the number of troops, the number of aircraft, tanks, ships, so it's massive. We're going to be in collective defence. Well, we can cut our defence budget. We don't need to prepare an army to mobilise about quarter million Finns mm -hmm. to fight the Russians in, in the border. We don't need to do that. Well, right now, projected Finnish military budget is going through the roof because it's it's new stuff. It's the modern military industrial complex are getting into Finland. The salesmen are getting in there and the Finnish military budget is going to rise. And actually, if you're being hard headed military point of view, they've just joined an alliance. They can see their budget go down and they're going to see their budget go up. Why? Because the military industrial complex are in there selling all these wonderfully new, very expensive questionable whether they use toys and stuff like that. I can't remember the figure, but the, the Finnish military budget projections, I just saw them last week, are absolutely massive. Compared to Britain, they're absolutely massive. And, you know, why? It just makes no sense, and it just increases tensions. And none of that, I don't think, was, was in the film. Oh, no, no, <laughs> I mean, sorry. I'm, I'm going off at a tangent again. I think, although... 
three and a half hours was a long film. Three and hours. Actually, we, I'm including the adverts at the beginning. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Long. Um, yeah, it kind of it left me with, with the impression it was of its time. And you're clearly talking about a moment in history. And it's interesting with a sort of historical lens on what happened. Yeah. But I think the thing that was missing for me, as well as the victims and the effect on them, was where we are today. I mean, just the sheer casual way that we talk about nuclear <laughs> weapons yeah. where we're, we're trying to rehabilitate it as clean power or as you know it, it just the world has changed completely and i don't think that necessarily came out that it's still affecting no yeah. it, it, cer yeah. it certainly didn't but that's probably another yeah. three, another three hours, hours. <laughs> and, and possibly a different director as yeah. well really i mean i yeah. suppose i thought he did a really really excellent job on <laughs> within the parameters that he gave himself yeah. actually and i think it's for you know having watched it and, and all the people you know who have watched it I, I bet it's up for a lot of oscars it would be up to us and and you know like you know you were saying yeah. earlier bill you know people who are still teaching in schools maybe it gives them a bit of impetus to kind of bring more yeah. of this into the uh, curriculum again maybe it kick starts things in in that sort of way but uh, you know as a film i think well, i thought it was excellent I mean, excellent yeah, and as you say, the film are two parts, and and I, I thought the performances were, were were very good. I was not expecting a three-hour movie to hold my. I mean, I like I'll go and watch historical movies. I, I like historical movies, per se. And as a, if I can put it like this, as a period piece, where people put on clothing and have different diets and different forms of transportation from what we have, it had the it had the period look to it. Mm -hmm. So as a piece of historical cinema. I thought it was excellent. The performances were good. And the fact that it sort of covered two different aspects, I found that quite engaging. And particularly you get a glimpse, as you said earlier on, in the second half of the movie of his and, and the wider community was involved in their yeah. politics. Yeah. Because yeah. it sort of left the sort of what we would call social democracy was very prevalent. In, in the United States, indeed, you you talked earlier on about you know some of the politicians. I mean, one of Roosevelt's vice presidents, I think he served only for one term, was I think his name was a uh, Henry Wallace, and he actually was a socialist. Mm -hmm. He was his vice president uh, for, for 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 one term. He was a he, he was a second he, he was a secretary of state as well before before that as well. But um, I thought the 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 performances were very good. Some of the close-ups of the faces mm -hmm. seemed to work really well. They got yeah. the emotions, yeah. and I thought I thought that that worked well as a piece of cinema. I, I thought I thought I can highly recommend it, and that's it. it. It's interesting that it hasn't so far as I think been released in Japan, oh. and uh, oh. I don't know if that has changed, but certainly it wasn't released as it was released in countries throughout the world, and when it does get released. Oh, it would be very interesting to hear <laughs> the reactions and yeah, the comments. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But of course, it's drama. And the great thing about drama is that it can touch us in ways and inform us in ways that political lectures can't. Absolutely, yes. It draws us into the issues, the, the moral dilemmas, but it also can make us think, and good drama makes us think. Yeah, good. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think that's a good uh, thought to finish on, uh, Isabel. Actually, I think you're dead. You're dead right with that. That's been great talking to both that's of you. And Bill, thanks for <laughs> suggesting, it and thanks both of you for, for coming in. And uh, okay, that was great. Yeah, great. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.